Welcome to Illo Talk, episode 128. I'm Corey Kerr, and today we're talking about why passion is stupid. And I say passion is stupid because a lot of people are out there trying to find what their passion is, or trying to use passion as the motivating and driving force in their side projects um, or in their uh, advancement of their creative careers. And passion is a fleeting emotion that you can't control. It's the worst thing that you can base stuff on. The what the professionals base things on is work. All right, so I don't normally like to do this because I think it's kind of a cheating or cliche way of doing things, but I want to read several definitions um, and see if this applies to your creative work, whether you're a musician or an artist or whatever. For me, I'm talking about visual art. I'm talking about illustration, right? So passion. Am I, am I passionate about illustration? Illustration is a huge part of my life. I spend a significant portion of my free time doing it. Am I passionate about it? Let's see. Passion. Strong and barely controllable emotion. I don't have a barely controllable emotion. I'm not at the drawing table um, working out a three-point perspective with a curvature roof, which is what I'm working on right now, and like can barely contain myself because I'm so freaking excited about it. Uh, not that one. Um, a state of outburst or strong emotion. Mm, not really. Intense sexual love. No. No. Not with my... Not with my illustration. I don't have intense sexual love with my with my work that I'm producing. Um, an intense desire or enthusiasm for something. Sometimes, sometimes I'm like, man, I just can't wait to get to the drawing table. But not every day, and I draw every day. And so I can't say that I'm passionate about illustration, though there are times when I feel this type of passion for the act of creating. Sometimes I'm like, oh man, I really want to get in there, right? An intense desire or enthusiasm for something. But it's not consistent. It's not consistent. There are other things in my life that I intensely desire and am enthusiastic for every time that opportunity presents itself. And usually those are physical. So let's say a thing arousing enthusiasm. I wouldn't even say I'm enthusiastic about illustration. I wouldn't even say I'm enthusiastic about art. There are times when I like nail it after slogging through something and it's pretty rough and you fight through it and at the end you're like, yeah, you know, before you hate it. Um, there are times that I experienced that, but that's not the reason I draw it either. What I'm talking about today is I want to talk about the reason you sit down at the table and start to work. Using passion as a motivation is stupid. Passion can come, but I believe that passion follows work. Okay, so passion comes from, um, let's see, a Latin word and an old French word that means suffering, right? And I do think that people do suffer for their art. I do think that people do, I, I know I get frustrated and there are times when it is difficult and there are times when I feel like I have wasted my time and hit a dead end. Um, physical suffering from sitting at the table. I have like a permanent knot in my back behind my left shoulder blade that's just there because of the way that I support myself at the drawing table when I'm not paying attention. So, so there's some there's some things with passion. If not passion, then what? What is it? What is the reason? that I sit down, what is my motivation to do this? There are easier things, there are more entertaining things, there are things that uh, I derive more um, physical pleasure from, um, there are things that release um, you know, chemicals in my brain that make me feel euphoric um, in a much easier way. So what is the reason, what is my motivation for sitting down to create? So frequently, not just infrequently, not just when the mood strikes me, but why do I push myself to do that? I've been thinking about this a lot. And I think a lot of it has to do with the difference between being an amateur and being a professional. I am a professional illustrator. Now, most people would take 
professional to mean getting paid to do stuff. And that is a definition of being a professional. But it's not the only definition, and I think it's actually the worst definition to focus on. Because again, uh, and I have a video on this, if you want to look at my video, money does money validate your art? Money will come or it won't. Success will come or it won't. And it is a side byproduct of the work, of the reason, of the motivation and the results that I'm actually seeking in my work. And so finances is not what it's all about. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't like to be wildly successful. I would, I would, I would take that money if it started rolling in. Um, but when you take somebody's money, you have to do what they say. And I like doing what I want to do. And so I only take on jobs because I, I have a day job that covers my bills. I only take on jobs that I want to. I only take on jobs that I'm excited about. I only take on jobs that I would probably do that job anyway. Um, and I might as well do it for a client. Uh, and if it's something that somebody's like, hey, we want you to go out and draw a bunch of kittens and, you know, I'm like, eh, I don't really care about that. And so I'm not going to do it. But if somebody comes to me and says, hey, we've got this idea um, where things are going to be blowing up and there's going to be a dude riding a motorcycle through the thing. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm all about that. Let's do it. Right. And so money doesn't define. Let's go back to the dictionary again. I hate that I'm using the dictionary so much in this one, but. It's just, I just want to define the terms that we're talking about. Okay, so we're talking about professional. Professional, of relating to or characteristic of a profession. Okay, so professions, uh, job, everything. Engaged in one of the learned professions, I'm worried about things like that. Um, characterized by or conforming to the technical or ethical standards of a profession. Or exhibiting a courteous, conscientious, and generally business like manner in the workplace. We're getting a little bit closer on that third one. Okay, here's, here's some more. Participating for gain or livelihood in activity or field of endeavor, often engaged in by amateurs. A professional golfer, a professional, whatever, right? And there's that difference, that juxtaposition between amateur and professional. Okay? And having a particular profession as a permanent career, you know, professional soldiers, what I do for my job, right? This is how I'm living. I'm a professional teacher. Um, following a line of conduct as though it were a profession. That's the one I like. Now, I've mentioned this book before, but in Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art, he talks about this difference. And this is where I got this, this idea that started getting me rolling. Um, this and uh, uh, Marshall Lee, friend of mine on um, YouTube, was we were having a conversation about what it is that, you know, why we do these things. And Stephen Pressfield talks about, Stephen Pressfield talks about the difference between turning pro and just doing something. So let's talk about an amateur. Now an amateur is somebody who does something for the love of that thing. Now the interesting thing about an amateur is that amateur comes from the French word, which is derived from an older Latin word, which means lover. And it means that you're doing it because you like it. You're doing it for the pleasure of it, right? And if you're doing something for the love, if you're doing something for the pleasure, if you're doing something for the fun, then when it's not pleasurable or fun, you stop doing it. And so being an amateur about something means you're super inconsistent, right? These are the people that often talk to me and tell me, I don't know how you find time to do that. I carve out the time. I make the time. I schedule the time. I force things into my schedule so that I have the time. That's how I find the time. I don't randomly just sit there and wait for the muse to float down and inspire me. And then all of a sudden, while I'm doing something else, I pop up out of my seat and go, I've got to go draw because I have an idea. That's not how it works for me. Sometimes, but very rarely, the type of people who say, I'm a writer and they don't write, those are amateurs. I'm an artist who doesn't draw, you're an amateur, right? And the reason for that is because you're doing it for the enjoyment. Now, I'm totally cool with that. I don't have a problem with that. And I don't want to use the word amateur as a slight or an insult, because if you're using art as a therapy or art as a lifestyle that enhances what you do and who you are as a pressure relief, as a, as a burnout um, avoidance valve. Um, that's cool. And I know people that do that. I know people that they watercolor because it helps them de-stress in their life. They're amateurs and that's fine. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? But they're not professionals. Now, what is the difference between a professional and an amateur? Well, a professional follows a line of conduct as if it was a profession. 
And Stephen Pressfield talks about this idea of turning pro. And he talks about you're already a professional at least one thing, and it's what you do for a living. It's what you do your day job. Now, that doesn't mean that you love your day job, but it does mean that you show up on time. It means that you are there when you're scheduled to be there. It means that you, even if you don't feel good, you do it. Even if you're not like, eh, I'm not really feeling work today, you still go in right? And a professional works by a professional code of standards. They show up every day. They show up whether they feel like it or not. They work when they're sick, you know, unless they're too sick and then they give themselves a break. But they, they work, not play. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't enjoy my job. There are parts of my job that I enjoy and I like it a lot. But if I had to sit there and grade for 40 hours a week, that would be awful. I would probably find another job. I don't like that part of my job. I'm not passionate about that part of my job. I'm not an amateur about that part of my job. I'm a professional when it comes to grading because I hate it. I don't like it. It is work. And I will sit down and I will do it because it is part of my job. Just like illustration and art and music. People do these things because there's something more than a fleeting emotion, right? And so, now that we've defined the difference between professional and amateur, I want to talk about something that is an interesting concept. Those of us that are raised in a capitalist system find the inherited ideas of motivation um, don't actually work that well. To a certain point they do, and within a narrow niche they do. There's a guy by the name of Daniel Pink who has done some research on this. And uh, I don't like taking one researcher's word for it. I like to kind of uh, gather a lot of data about this, but this actually rings true to me. And so I'm going to talk about it because it feels right. Now, he says within a certain narrow niche, um, you can increase the reward for something or increase the punishment for something and it will increase productivity. And it's when you don't have to think or feel something. Right? If it's, if it's a mundane task that can be done over and over and over again and it doesn't involve any heavy cognitive process, then uh, you can increase the reward and increase the speed of production. But when it comes to things where it involves creativity or things like that, uh, then it becomes uh, a little counter, counterintuitive. And he actually says that there are three things that, that do that. And autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Now, autonomy means self-directed. I can do whatever I want within, within this thing or within a reason. I can make a lot of decisions. I have some autonomy um, to be able to decide. I'm not a, I'm not a voice activated monkey, um, you know, being told or micromanaged what to do. So I've, I'm given some autonomy. Okay. Mastery means that there is room for improvement. And this is something that I love about creativity and the arts um, in general is if I am learning the guitar, uh, there's, there's a certain level of proficiency before I can say that I play the guitar. But once I reach that, I'm not done. I can continue to increase, uh, you know, line by line and continue to grow in my skill set in such a way um, that I'm continuing to master new things. There's always things to be tackled, always things to be mastered. In my own work, I can look back at the last four or five years now, I think. I started in 2012. Um, I've seen some significant improvement. I have mastered specific things, but there's still worlds of things that I haven't mastered yet. And so there's a lot of mastery to be done. And every day I work closer and closer to this mastery. There's constant improvement with the work. I get a lot of satisfaction seeing myself improve. I get a lot of satisfaction looking at a page and go and saying, that page is better than I could have done a week ago and infinitely better than I could have done five months ago. And so there's that mastery. Purpose is the one that I struggle with, but purpose is the third one. And for me, I find it very difficult to define my purpose in art. I hear a lot of people say, you know, you shouldn't get into comics if you don't know why you're not, if you don't know why you're doing it, uh, you got to clearly state your goals, got to clearly state your purpose. And I've never been able to do that. I don't know why I do it. 
after all of this, I know I've been talking for 20 to 25 minutes, but after all of this, I'm still not sure what motivates me. Other than I believe that motivation and the result of motivation, uh, you know, dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin and all those chemicals in your brain and body that make you feel good when you accomplish something. Motivation follows work. And so, like last night, I fought the resistance hard. I sat down and procrastinated so long. And then it was a struggle. I was, I was penciling out the perspective grid of this thing. I'll just show you. So there's this thing I'm working on and it's in, I wanted to do three point perspective, but then I just got really tired of drawing lines. And so it's in two point perspective and just trying to figure that out. I'm, I'm not good at, I, under, I, have a, I have a solid understanding of per perspective, but I'm not, I don't have it in my hands yet. It's not in my fingertips. It's all, it's all in my head. And so forcing it down from my head into my arm uh, it takes time and work and it's still a struggle and I struggled for so long and then eventually I kind of was fluid with it and I was kind of flowing, but it, it took a couple hours actually. Um, and there are other things where I've practiced enough to where I've moved that knowledge into my fingers. For example, um, I've spent a decent amount of time trying to figure out tree bark uh, with a brush pen. And so I can sit down and just noodle without thinking and I can do a fairly convincing, at least for me, uh, tree trunk. Um, but when it comes to buildings and structures and perspective, I know it, but it's not in my fingers yet. But eventually, and this is, I think, my purpose, I lost myself a little bit in the work and started to enjoy it. And it was a hard push up until that point. Um, and so if you have autonomy, if you have the opportunity for mastery, and if you have purpose, um, those are the three keys of motivation. Now, when I'm talking motivation, I'm talking about the difference between external motivation and intrinsic motivation, right? Internal, external. Um, and so ex extrinsic? That's not a word. Um, internal, internal motivation or, or motivation that flows from within me that I produce myself versus external motivation, which is something that is uh, that I'm being compelled or forced or incentivized outside of myself. For example, the carrot and the stick. Okay, um, if I'm getting more money to do a thing, that is external motivation. That's client work, right? If I am doing um, something to avoid a negative instance or a uh, punishment, uh, I'm, I'm doing this so that I don't get fired. That's an external motivation, right? But if I'm doing something because there's a deep-seated desire to improve, if I'm working on something because I want to work on it, if I choose myself without the possibility of or guarantee of reward or punishment, that's an internal motivation. And that type of intrinsic motivation is the type of motivation that lasts. It's the type of motivation that supersedes passion and emotion and things that come and go beyond your control. Um, if you rely on passion, then you are going to be sorely disappointed because you will get very few good results it will be fleeting and every time you sit down, it'll eventually be frustrating because you're never going to get good at it, especially a skill that takes hundreds and thousands of hours of work to get to the point where you're feeling proficient. Uh, if you rely on passion, then you're just going to be an amateur. You're just going to be doing it for the love but you're not going to be doing it for the self-mastery. You're not going to be doing that for the autonomy. You're not going to be doing it for some greater purpose, for something that springs from within. And so it's interesting to try to look at why it is that we do things. It's interesting to analyze 
what it is that moves us. It's interesting to look at um, what causes us to, to act because then we can steer our lives in a way that will give us a lot of satisfaction, a lot of fulfillment. And personally, um, I think that there are two main motivating forces in the world. Um, and one has short-term and instantaneous gratification. Okay, and one has delayed gratification, um, but is a longer lasting um, system of reward. And so if you look at instantaneous gratification, I'm talking about drugs, I'm talking about, uh, you know, just random sex, not intimacy with a partner. Um, I'm talking about those type of kind of instantly you get, a, you get, your, you get your fix and then there's a fall off almost immediately, right? And those type of instant things, um, you know, they're not all bad. For example, I, I, for me, video games are an instant gratification. And the difference for me uh, versus instant or delayed long term is how I feel after doing it for an extended period of time. And so when I sit down to play video games and I play video games for an hour or for half an hour, and then I go do other things, it's cool. I got, I got some feedback, I got some response, it was fun, it was kind of a fleeting moment, and I enjoyed it, right? But on those days, on those Saturdays when my family's away and, and I sit there and I play for 12 hours straight, after that, I don't feel like I've accomplished anything. I don't feel like I've leveled up in any significant way personally, even though my character, my avatar, the, the, you know, the, the person that I'm controlling... They, they might have gotten, you know, little things. They're all empty calories. It's, it's an instantaneous response with an immediate fall off. Now, things that I've spent in my life, some significant amount of work and time and effort that hasn't always been immediately gratifying, those things are the things that I value the most. I can think of um, my relationship with my wife. That hasn't always been fun. Um, and you can tell her I said that. Just kidding. Uh, no, but for both of us, we've both had to put work into that. And because we're both willing to work, it has become a mutually beneficial and long-term um, satisfaction in my life. Um, there were times, periods of months and sometimes years where it was mostly work. And now I've gotten to the point where there are periods of work, but mostly satisfaction. Um, other things, my art. I've been doing this now solidly for, uh, for about four or five years, and I'm starting to get to the point where it is more often than not at least fulfilling than frustrating. It's still frustrating, and there are still times where it's just a fight. It's just a, just a knuckle-bleeding ball in the alley against myself, and you just feel beat up. But those are fewer than the times where I feel like I put in some good work and accomplish something. And so all of that, the long term, all of those things, I don't allow my satisfaction to be 100% on what other people think of it or my commercial success, of which I've had very little at this point. Um, and so... All of those things, they give me fulfillment and satisfaction because I'm able to continue to improve, do whatever I want within those things, and there's a purpose. I believe that creation for its in and of itself is significantly important for human beings, um, and that if you're not doing some type of creation, you are denying a large portion of what makes you human. There's a difference between us and the animal kingdom. And whether you don't believe in God or do believe in God, there is a difference. And that main difference is creativity. And so if you are not exercising creativity, then in my opinion, you're merely surviving. And a life of survival is a baseline. A life of survival is, is a threshold by which you should only go up. And so if survival is your baseline because you're not exercising any creativity, 
you might want to take up some sort of creative practice because you will find you will begin to feel something that you haven't necessarily felt before, and that is um, satisfaction in a delayed and long-term case. So, so there's my rant about professional, amateur motivation and why passion is a stupid reason to do stuff. Um, I'm curious what you guys think. So I know in the past I have suggested to people that they should have a passion project, and I'm not going to use that term anymore. I don't like the term passion project. It's fleeting, and frankly, it's cliche. Um, it's a trite expression that people use to define something that people do on the side, and it's almost become a resume builder. And, uh, and, and I think creation and side projects and side hustles can be significantly more than a resume builder. Um, in fact, I have a Facebook group, if you guys want to be part of it, where we, it's called Side Hustle Passion Projects, and I'll link to it in the description of this video. And we go and we critique each other's work or just share work and look for, look for reinforcement. Um, and it's a, it's a small group now, but, but, but it's, it's kind of fun. So I'm curious, uh, do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you think passion is great? Do you guys feel passion for your work? Um, you know, I mean, do you feel a strong, intense uh, emotion that you almost can't control when you sit down to the drawing table? And if so, how do you do that? Because I want to know, because that would be awesome. Um, but for me, for me, I don't feel that. Uh, most of the time, I have at times. I have at times I've done stuff where I want to stand up and run and go find somebody and say, look at this thing. I made a cool hand. Look at how the hand looks. Uh, there are those moments, but they are fleeting. Little blips, little spikes, little shooting stars, not the consistent light of the night sky. So let me know in the comments what you think about that. I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on uh, your thoughts is on passion as a motivating force, uh, one. And two, what is it that makes you guys do stuff that you're not required to do? What motivates you to put in extra effort um, that's coming from within you, inside of you, rather than externally uh, a stick or a carrot? Big long rant over. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to show you real quick I what I'm working on. I haven't actually been doing any recordings of me drawing. And I'll have to get back into that if you guys want me to. If that's interesting to watch me do that, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll start doing that a little bit more again. But um, I've been really struggling to, to get any work done lately. And so it's been, it's been a hard fight and like setting up a camera and lights and stuff just seemed like more work than it was worth. So here's a page that I finished. Um, you know, and if you're following me on Instagram, or Twitter, you've seen this, but let me show you some of the detail work here. So there's there's the bird kind of eating, and we've got you know her in the background. I might I might show some extra footage of this. Um, I worked out a cool way to do kind of the thatched roof, so it looks like we're inside of this room. And then I redid the water. Um, it was pretty bad, and I screwed it up, and then I added some. Um, I added some whiteout to it, and that helped a lot, just being able to redo that. And I don't know why I beat myself up when I use whiteout, because um, I don't beat myself up when I press control, control Z or command Z. Uh, so I don't know why I do that, but I feel like I failed when I get the whiteout out. But I'm really glad that I got the whiteout out on this page because um, it ended up turning out really well. It gave me the contrast that I needed. Um, it gave me the contrast that I needed in the water and whatever else. And then uh, played with a little bit. I've been really enjoying um, Deleter 2, uh, which is this bottle of white. Because I've been struggling to find... Um, I've been struggling to find a white that I like. And uh, this Deleter 2 is pretty cool. Um, I'll link to it in the description of this video. It's pretty thick. Um, and they said that it was thick in the description, the product description. And I thought, oh yeah, but it's pretty thick. And so I wonder if I could, I haven't experimented with like watering it down or anything yet. It's very opaque, which I really like. Um, and it brushes on well. And so I've been doing that. Then, uh, as I showed you before, 
Uh, I've been working on this page, which is kind of a giant splash page, um, introducing the sparrow, and we're going to have clouds swirling around in the sky, and then I've got kind of the um, his little house in the mountains, like that, and we'll have a lot of foliage uh, at the bottom. So, kind of those, that's what I've done in the past uh, uh, two, three days, three days. So yeah. Anyway, you can find my stuff at CoreyKerr.com, and uh, I have a video page organized there. So if you go to CoreyKerr.com slash videos, you can see all the different playlists. Um, if you haven't yet, like this video. If you've made it this far, hit that little thumbs up. That helps me. YouTube promotes uh, the video when more people do that. And uh, commenting is also awesome um, if you have that. And if you haven't subscribed yet um, and you like hearing me talk about stuff like this or you'd like to hear me talk about other things, um, go ahead and subscribe. Um, and you can also hit that little bell and that'll notify you when I, when I make videos, which I do about once or twice a week at the most. Um, and so, yeah, do those things. Uh, and then if you want like more immediate updates and some things, then you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and all of those social media links are in the description of this video. And we will catch you guys later. I'm out. Moonwalking away. about 65 years old so it's about 65 years old and ha and you got this as a retirement gift right yeah well I am um, the school farm or the school I worked for was given this tractor by a farmer who used it very little but they used it on the school farm but I did a lot of extra work one year and I said and they said I said don't pay me just keep track of it, and what I want to do is when I retire, just give me that old John Deere tractor and I'll take it with me. So that's how I got it. That's cool. And I've been giving grandkids a ride on it ever since. <laughs> and great grandkids. <laughs> yeah, Scarlett loves it. Yeah, I'm on. Okay, that's the gas gauge. Use regular gasoline. And this tractor was made in 1952. It was the last year they made this two cylinder tractor. They have a cylinder on each side, so you can see the spark plug right here. So that's the spark plug that's there? That's the spark plug here. And there's just one? And there's, there's one, one on this side, side and one on the other side. And it, it has a, this is a starter. They used to, before this model, before later in the, about since uh, 1940s, it just had a flywheel here. When you started them, you just pushed the flywheel. But this has a starter down there. And so you turn on the gas and that's the throttle right here. You put the throttle a third away up. And then when you push the starter, if it doesn't start, this is a choke. You pull the choke out for three seconds, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and push it in. <laughs> if you leave it on too long, it'll flood it out. But you gotta have it in neutral here. These are the gear shifts. Six, six gears, first, second, and fourth over here, and third, fifth, and sixth here. It reverses over here. Boy, so it's got six gears, stuff. and it's got hydraulics, and they put hydraulics in the 40s. And so hydraulics is a great thing for tractors, but uh, you have to have the clutch engaged for this hydraulics to work. This is the clutch here. It's a hand clutch. It's the opposite of a car. If you want it to engage it, you push it forward. If you want to disengage it, 
you pull it back. And this is a wheel wheel brake. So that, that's the one that'll spin you if you hit yeah, it too hard. Yeah, a, a tractor, this tractor has a wheel brake on each wheel. And they're designed so that when you're tilling out in the farm and you want to turn around, you can push this wheel brake and this wheel will stop. And the other tractor, the other wheel will take you right around and you can spin right on a dime. And get going the other direction. Put your hydraulic tools down and then keep farming. So when you do that, does that does that disengage the drive of the wheel or does it actually compress like a like a drum or something? The drum is right here. Oh, okay. This is the brake drum. And it, it, it does both. It disengages the wheel and holds that wheel solid so the other wheel drives it around. This tractor doesn't have hydraulic steering. It's a uh, Jack Armstrong string steering. And you can't hardly turn this thing unless you uh, Unless you're moving. This is called aloe vera. See how thick that leaf is? If you take a knife, you can pinch it like that. Watch the thorns on the side. Take a knife and cut that leaf and just rub it over the bee sting and it'll take the hurt right away. Really? That's what they, and if you ever get burned from a sunburn or something, you take one of these leaves, open them up, just rub it all over your sunburn and it'll just take the burn right away. Cool, Daddy can get some. So this is this is his pond, and right here he's got a water pump that pumps to this pressurizer, and he waters his whole property um, out of his pond, and then it all runs back downhill, whatever's left, back into the pond. Maybe we'll send you and Cory to go get us some burgers. What's that? Are you still filming? Yep. Oh, you can stop.